children, our youth, our online congregation around the world. Come on, First Church, celebrate our partners in ministry. Come on, that's right, wave at them real quick. Wave at our online church. Wave at, come on, some of them are your cousins. Wave at them. Amen. <laughs> We're glad there are preachers watching. Many, many preachers tell me they watch me sitting in their office in their robe just before they go out. We're praying for you, preacher. I want you to know that all of you, brothers and sisters, go preach. Go give the devil a black eye. Make the devil sorry he ever picked on you. Preach with power. First Church and I are lifting you in prayer. The passage of scripture has already been read by Minister Vivian Anderson, Luke chapter 23. Very, very brief passage of scripture. It's so brief, Gail, we're just going to read it again. Because, I mean, there's no place for me to jump in without doing textual damage. So let's read 39 to 43. I promise you won't be reading long. Let's read it. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Church, say amen. So seated in the presence of the Lord. Beloved, the death of our Lord, his crucifixion and execution, is not only, Brother Huey White, one of the most seminal moments in the history of our world, but Aunt Dolores, it is also one of the most sacred. What claims and what calls our attention today is amazingly on that day in the midst of an event that was for him both personal and painful. Our Lord, actually, my Murray, stops dying so that he might give his attention to a thief on a cross. And in that one magnanimous and magnificent act, our Lord amazingly makes this thief one of the people in his life. Deacons, when one considers the unusual and even unconventional nature of this particular act, one has to ask, what prompted, what motivated, what compelled Jesus to do this? And the answer, as best I can surmise, simply and yet supremely is this. Jesus saw what he was about to do as his life work. It was what he came to do, and so he did it all the way until the end of his life. Beloved, the actions of Jesus on that cross and his response to the request of that dying man says three powerful truths about the one we serve as Lord. I think sometimes, beloved, we uh, are so distant from Jesus. The years, the decades, the centuries have now separated us from those moments when he walked these mundane shores. That we have become, how shall I say it, anesthetized, immune, almost devoid of understanding what a figure our Lord was. 
we hail him uh, for the most part. We, uh, we acknowledge him for the most part. We, we bow down to him, Marsha, for the most part. We at least give lip service to him. We, we mentally, verbally assent that he is Lord, that he is Adonai, that he is our king and our sovereign. We, we do that lip service. We give flippant, casual, cavalier a conventional is the word that I'm looking for recognition to him but it may be that none of us or few of us really know who he is that, that, that we have become uh, it, it's sort of like figures in history uh, I was about to say George Washington but, but Kim this is Black History Month so I will not lift up George Washington I'll lift up another George George Washington Carver <laughs> That, that, that we, we, we know of him, the peanut farmer, brilliant of mind, uh, this man who graduated from the University of Iowa, who literally saved the state of Alabama. I, I do not know if we really understand what was behind the genius of George Washington Carver when he went south, when he went to Alabama. Uh, the bow weevil, y'all don't know nothing about that, the bow weevil had decimated the soil of Alabama it was not just the bow we do y'all have time for this it was not just the bow weevil uh, it was years of planting the same crops that had eaten out the nourishment and the nutrients that were in the soil so that nothing was growing and, and Carver comes to Alabama. I, I, I wish I had time. He comes to Alabama and he partners up with another a black educator by the name, uh, you, you remember him, Booker T. Washington. Uh, who has started Tuskegee Institute. And, and they hook up together. They connect. It is a wonderful thing when brilliance meets brilliance. Okay, I would say something, but I'm going to leave it alone. It's a wonderful thing when people meet one another and are not threatened by each other and do not compete with one another, but find a way to complement and complete one another. Would you look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm not against you. I, I'm not your competition. I'm not in your life to compete. I'm in your life to complete you. He comes, I, I'm printing there through. He comes to Alabama. The bow weevil has destroyed it. Uh, planting the same crop, cotton, year after year after year, has sucked the very nutrients out of the soil of Alabama. And this brilliant uh, scholar and scientist, oh, did I tell you that's why you're still sitting there? I did not tell you that uh, George Washington Carver was actually born a slave. He was so weak and so sickly that he could not be sold as a slave. They actually traded him for a horse. I would say something, but you are not ready for it. You better watch how you measure folk and how you evaluate folk because folk you think are nobody may be God somebody. I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone, but I sure feel like putting my weight on it. It's amazing how we characterize people and how we put people in certain segments and spots and places, say they're worth this and they're worth that, and they're not. Here's what we must remember, that in God's eyes, everybody is somebody and everyone has something to offer. I, I, I'm almost through Helen Carver. Carver, Carver comes up, amazing scientist that he is, having been educated at the University of Iowa, this ex slave. He, he comes, he comes uh, to Alabama and he introduces uh, the, the peanut to Alabama, the peanut. And he says that uh, um, scientifically, uh, ag uh, by agronomy, agriculturally, uh, he says, uh, based on his study, that if you would plant peanuts, there are nutrients uh, and bodies and vitamins in the peanut that will not take out of the soil, but will add to the soil. 
Y'all ain't with me. And so he convinces them to start planting peanuts and the soil is rejuvenated and revived and the culture and the economy of Alabama is saved because of the brilliance of a black scientist who was an ex-slave. The same Alabama that was filled with segregation the same Alabama that Rosa Parks was in on December 1st 1955 the same Alabama that bombed churches and tried to destroy Martin King and the Montgomery improvement y'all ain't helping me with history the same Alabama that sought to deny black people their rights owed their existence to a black man by the name of George Washington Carver how soon we forget folk who helped get us where we are. But that ain't new, y'all. That's the Bible. Same thing happened with Joseph. Y'all remember Joe? Joseph in over there in Egypt. God gives him the interpretation of the dream and saves the Egyptian economy. And then there arises a Pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph. And in slaves, y'all still ain't with me. I'm trying to hook up history and theology and sociology so y'all can go out of here with a new sense of philosophy. How you gonna live your life on Monday through Saturday, not just on Sunday. It's ever that way. It's ever that way. Our Lord, here's what I was really trying to get to, our Lord seems to have this uncanny act and ability to pick the weirdest, strangest, most unusual, most unlikely folk to be in his crowd. I mean, I wish he had talked to me. I could have picked a better posse than the one he came up with. But Jesus is always kicking it with unusual folk. Last night, we saw him hanging with a lady with a shady past. And that woman at the well of Samaria, she had five, count them, five husbands. And now she's shacking up with a boyfriend. And then the, this morning, 8 o'clock, uh, we watched Jesus invite a demonically possessed man who lives in the cemetery. Uh, he invites this gathering demoniac to be in his family in his life. It's amazing. We've looked at the places of Jesus, the prayers of Jesus, and we're keeping this series going about Jesus, a life key. And now, amazingly, we come to the people of Jesus. A woman with a shady past. Who would have picked her? A man possessed with demons living in the cemetery. Who would have picked him? Jesus does. Okay, y'all missed a good shout. Jesus does. And I don't know why y'all still sitting there because Jesus did then and he still does now. Because I wonder, do I have anybody at First Church in the 10 o'clock? I know this is the uppity crowd, but can y'all admit before you got uppity, you were down and out and you had nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. And he looked beyond your fault and saw your need. And the only reason you're saved today is because he's still going around picking out unlikely folk to be in his life. Picks, picks a woman at the well in Sychar. He picks a gathering demoniac living in the cemetery. And hey, y'all, would you believe it? As his last act for he exits the stage. You think our Lord would learn something by now? <laughs> think he'd improve the folk he runs with. But just before he dies, he grabs one more unlikely person. And this dude may be the most unlikely of all because he's a thief hanging on a cross. And yet Jesus in an act of magnanimous, magnificent favor invites this man to be a person in his life. Here's the relevant question that I want to raise before I sit down. What made Jesus do it? Why would Jesus, he's already my Mary dying, hung up, on trumped up charges, hung up for my hangups, dying for my sin. Why, what is it about this Jesus that he has this savior complex? <laughs> that he's always trying to save people. And he comes down to the end, the last, not day of his life, these are the last minutes of his life. 
Life is ebbing out, flowing out. Blood is oozing out. He's been beaten and battered and bruised. I mean, the brother don't have much left. And while, okay, y'all ain't seeing it. While he trying to die. Okay, y'all didn't get it. Lisa, while he trying to die. I mean, he, he's given his life. He's been beaten. He's been whipped. He's been spat upon. He's been beaten with a Roman flagellum. He's been stripped. He's been humiliated. The brother is just trying. Just leave me alone. Give me a few more minutes. I'm up out of here. Exit stage right. The brother trying to die. And while he's trying to die, somebody stops him and says, I know what you've been doing. And I know it's the 11th hour, but I wonder, can you hook a brother up? When you come into your kingdom, would you remember me? And here's what's shocking, y'all. And Jesus stops dying. Tells death, chill. Wait, hold on, sucks it up, gathers some strength, calls on energy, and puts death on hold and turns and say, what did you say? Today I say to you, when I go in, you going in with me today. I want to sit down. That's all y'all need. Today, you will be with me in paradise. It's amazing, Brenda, it's amazing that our Lord would act like that towards this, uh, this admitted y'all thief. These ain't trumped up charges. He says to his friend, he said, would you be quiet? You know, they tell me not to say shut up. Would you be quiet? We are getting what we deserve. In other words, we guilty as charged. We done robbed folk, ripped folk off, beat folk up. We have done it all. Grand larceny, everything. We done it. Fraud. We done it. We did it. You name it, we did it. And it's finally caught up with us. And we are getting what we deserve. But not this man. And then he stops talking to him and starts talking to him. Okay, I'm through. Y'all missed it. That was for free. He stops talking to him and starts talking to him. Okay, y'all missed it because some of y'all talking to the wrong folk. And the folk you're talking to can't do nothing for you. You better stop talking to them and talk to him. And our Lord stops dying long enough to reach this guy. Why, why does he do it, Pastor Rufus? Three things and I'll bid you good day. First is the mission of Jesus. Come here, come here, come here. Look with me at it. The, Jesus said it himself. The son of man, my Mary, came to seek and save those who were lost. Okay, y'all missed it. Did not come to call the righteous, Sharon, but sinners to repentance. They who are well don't need a physician. Okay, okay, y'all, y'all don't, which, oh God, can I say it? Y'all won't get mad. Doug, that may be why some saints, not y'all, Saturday night, 8 o'clock, them folk, maybe why they act like they act when they come to church because they ain't never been sick. But sick folk need a doctor. And Jesus says, I didn't come for stuck up saints who ain't never been sick. I'm looking for down and out sinners who know they are sick in need of a savior because there is a bomb in Gilead. Okay, I'm through. I'm through. That's all I got. That's all I got. It's the mission of Jesus to seek and to save the lost. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm slap happy. I promise I am. I'm slap happy that that's his mission. I'm happy. Here's why. I'm happy, P, because it mean when I was lost he came looking for me and I don't think there's a person in this room who's saved who is not able to admit that when you were lost you weren't looking for him but God knows he was looking for you come on can I get a little help right there that's why I keep telling y'all stop talking about how you found Jesus you didn't find Jesus because Jesus was never lost you were lost and Jesus found you 
his mission, his mission. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. Write these three things down. I got to go. First thing I noticed, A, is Jesus is clear about his mission. He's clear about it. There's no ambiguity. There's no uncertainty. There's no lack of clarity. He's clear about his mission. I am on assignment. I am on mission to save the lost. And that brother is lost. And my mission is clear. Not only was Jesus clear about his mission, but Pop, Jesus is committed to his mission. I love that. I wish I had more committed folk in this church. Did I say that just now? I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I wish, Pop Rawls, I had more committed people in this church. Okay, I'm waiting for some of y'all to say amen. That's why I need more committed people, because y'all won't even say amen when I say I wish I had them. I wish, Aunt D, I had more committed folk who wouldn't get mad and go on a sit-down strike. I, I really wish I had more committed people who were not concerned about getting their name called, but were more concerned about getting the job done. I wish I had more committed people who don't have to be out front, but are willing to be behind the scenes, who don't have to be the star, but can be a member of the supporting cast. I wish I had more committed folk who say, if you don't never call my name, that's all right. All that my hands find to do, I'm going to do it with all of my mind because Jesus remembers when others forget and he will reward. I wish I had some more committed folk up in here who say come hell or high water you can count on me. Jesus is clear about his mission. Jesus is committed to his mission. Here's C under one. Can y'all see how quick I'm moving this? And C, Jesus completes his mission. Man, he doesn't die till it's done. And, and I'm going to say this to my mother if I got to run out the pulpit. And he doesn't let folk talking about him, criticizing him, or crucifying him stop him from completing his mission. Tell the neighbor, say, I think he's talking all about you right now. Because it's amazing. His hands are nailed. His feet are nailed. His head has thorns. His side has a wound. But he's still doing his mission even though they are crucifying him. And I understand some of us today because we ain't never been crucified. If folk look at us funny, we walk away. I wish to God I had somebody in first church who said I'm going to complete the mission that God has given me. I don't care what folk do to me. Would you give a neighbor some sanctified debt and tell him complete your mission and stop thinking everybody's going to like you and that everyone's going to support you and everybody's going to be patting you on the back. You're going to run into some haters. You're going to run into some critics. You're going to run into some folk who don't like you. I wish I had help up here. You're going to run into folk who will dig ditches for you. But do I have anybody here who can testify that the Lord will lead you all around it. He'll be a bridge over it. And he'll help you get where he wants you to go. It's, it's, it's the mission of Jesus. I got to hurry. It's not just the mission of Jesus. Come here, come here. Look at this with me. It's the ministry of Jesus. Would you tap a neighbor, say ministry? Now look back at that same neighbor, smile and say, you do not want the ministry of Jesus. No, you don't want it. You don't want it. You don't want it. I know you don't want it. No, the choir don't want it. All that singing they just did, they don't want it. Mm -mm. Lacey don't want it. Where's Peggy? Is Peggy still here? Is Evangelist still here? She left. Y'all celebrate Evangelist Peggy Lacey. She had to go. Where's Lacey? Lacey, Lacey, you don't want it. You don't want it. No, you don't want it. Winston, you don't. I know you holy, Winston, sitting there looking all deep. You, you, you don't want it. None of these deacons want it. None of these preachers want it. None of y'all want it. You know why you don't want it? Because more than you realize, the ministry of Jesus was often to one person. And y'all rather be up in front of a crowded choir. And some of y'all don't want to be on the praise team at 8 o'clock because there ain't enough folk for you. You got a 10 o'clock anointing. 
Sylvia, stop laughing. You got a 10 o'clock anointing. Some of y'all don't want to preach on Saturday night. You got a Sunday morning anointing. But I'm going to say this if I got to run out the room. If your anointing ain't good for one, it ain't good for a thousand. Come on, can I preach? Pastor Kelly, can I preach? No, no. If you don't have an anointing of one person, I'm scared of you with a 500 people. Because if you don't see the value of one, then your priorities are out of place. Preach, Clark, doing the best I can with a black suit on. Come on, tell a neighbor, you got to minister to one. I've been talking all weekend about the people in the life of Jesus. The gathering demoniac, one. The woman at the well, one. The brother on the cross, one. Blind man, one. Look, I mean, y'all thought the five thousand later for them. That was one. Four thousand once. Nicodemus, one man. Jairus' daughter, one girl. The widow of Nain's son, one boy. Jesus is a master at the ministry of one. Tell your neighbor, say, he told you you don't want that ministry. You want to you wanna shine. You want to you wanna live large. You want to be on TBN and Daystar and the Word Network. You want folk calling your name. You want to get on and off planes. You, you want to be a minister to the multitude. But you don't qualify to serve the multitude until you can serve the one. I need a better amen for what I just said. ministry of Jesus is to one person. I wonder what would you do for one? <laughs> While you're trying to get your bonabetes and your creds and pump up your resume, how you doing with one? When did you speak to one? When did you encourage one? When did you pray for one? When did you help one? The ministry of Jesus is a ministry to one. Tim, that's what you do. It's, it's through Fellowship of Christian Athletes. It's ministering to one young boy at a time. Just one. It's one. It's, it's not goo gobs of them. It's just one. That old song, the old saying, saying, I bring to the Savior just one. If I can help somebody <laughs> as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody, not body, somebody, singular, with a word or song, if I can show somebody, singular, they're traveling wrong, Gwenny, Mary, then my living will not be in vain. It wasn't just the mission of Jesus, Mom Mary. It's the ministry of Jesus. Let me, let me hit it real quick and move on. Here's the first thing I noticed about the ministry of Jesus to one person. He never turned from one or turned one away. Never did. One came to him. Matter of fact, most times when he did First Lady Counts, I want to say something. I'm probably going to get in trouble. Uh, most time when Jesus did deal with a bunch of folk, it turned out bad. <laughs> like when he fed the 5,000 and they ate, burped, and left. <laughs> Healed 10 lepers, nine went away, only one came back. Palm Sunday, the crowd followed him. And then on Friday, the same crowd cried, crucify me. <laughs> Deacon William Yardbear, I think Jesus said, I know crowds. Let me deal with one. Because I've often told you, you never know when a crowd's going to turn into a mob. <laughs> he never turned one away. He never turned from one. Write this down. B, he never lost track of the value of one. That's really what I'm trying to say. Get that run with it. He never lost track of the value of one. 
that one matters. I, I, oh, it's 11 o'clock. Did I tell y'all that story uh, about the day when um, Spurgeon, I believe it was Spurgeon, got saved in a service. Spur Spurgeon got saved, and he was the only one who got saved. He was just a young person, uh, and he got saved. And the preacher that night went home feeling so discouraged because all that preacher, only one person got saved. I think it was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. If it wasn't Spurgeon, then it was Moody. It was one of the two. It was either Moody or Spurgeon. Google it and find out. Uh, but it was either Spurgeon or Moody, and one got saved, and the preacher felt so bad. Uh, but later on, he discovered that that one changed the course of the world. You never know the value of the one. The value of the one. I have a friend. He became my friend through my brother, Dr. the late Dr. Charles Edward Booth. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Amos C. Brown. Amos pastored the Third Baptist Church in San Francisco for many years. He's had a stroke, and he's not as strong as he used to be. But one of Amos's great stories, y'all won't believe this, is that Dr. King taught one class at Morehouse College, Morehouse, the, the, his alma mater, the school he graduated from. He taught one class. I think it was in sociology. Dr. King taught one class. Y'all missed it. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. taught one class at Morehouse College. Y'all still didn't get Dr. King taught one class. That ain't to shout. Shout is one student enrolled. It was Amos Brown. <laughs> Dr. King had one class and one student signed up. It was Amos Brown. Y'all ain't with me. And for that whole semester, he had the undivided attention of one of the most brilliant minds in, the, in American history because nobody saw what was in King, but Amos Brown signed up. And can I just tell you today, you never know impact of one when you touch a life he never lost track of it and then here's here's see i gotta go he never treated one any less than he treated a crowd gave the same attention he gave the same time he gave the same effort he gave this would y'all stop waiting on a bigger crowd to do good just do good i'm gonna say this if i gotta run out the pulpit i'm y'all please I done begged y'all to get off Facebook. I done begged y'all to do it. Y'all ain't going to do it. So let me give you some Facebook protocol. Let me give you some. See, you're not going to get off. So let me give you some Facebook etiquette. When you help somebody, stop posting it. Okay, just stop it. Just stop. Stop taking selfies of you giving somebody a dollar. I mean, if you're going to post it, give them 50. Come on, at least give them 20. Don't laugh, Pastor Kelly. Come on now, we ain't going to brag about a dollar. I'm posting, here I am. The Lord touched my heart to help them. And you giving them a blessed, blasted dollar? At least give them a 20, you're going to put it on Facebook. But I heard somewhere, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing in relationship to your benevolence. Because if you do it in secret, the one who sees in secret will reward you openly. But if you do it for Facebook, you already got your reward. Preach Clark, doing the best I can in my black suit. Would you tap a neighbor, say get your focus right. never treated one any less than he did the multitude and that allowed Jesus to reach one rescue one and redeem one here's the third point the mercy of Jesus everybody say the mission of Jesus say the ministry of Jesus can I shout out the door on the mercy of Jesus yeah th this man turns to Jesus and says Lord I know I messed up I know I know I'm a criminal I'm a thug my face is in every, every post office in this town. I have done everything they said and stuff they don't know. But when you come into your kingdom, if you are who they say you are, if, if what they wrote on that superscription, this is Jesus, King of the Jews, if that's who you are, then when you get into your kingdom, Mr. King, would you remember me? 
And at that moment, I feel like preaching this, mercy started flowing toward that man. I don't know why y'all still sitting there. That's all I got. I shouldn't have to preach beyond that. Mercy started flowing to that man. And I wonder, do I have anybody here who has been the recipient of the mercy of God? Come on, do I have anybody at the 10 o'clock service who says the only reason I'm alive, the only reason I'm standing is because his mercy is great. Come on, morning by morning, new mercy, I see all I've ever needed. Your hand has provided. Help me close it, y'all. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. How far the neighbor say, neighbor, I'm living by the mercy of God. Mercy woke me up this morning. Mercy started me on my way. Mercy kept me clothed and in my right mind. Mercy has helped me to live saved when I felt like going back. Everything I have and everything I am is by the mercy I feel like preaching and the grace of God. I double dog somebody just throw back your head and holler mercy that's what happened on that cross y'all it was mercy it's what the old saints used to sing mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burdened soul I wish y'all knew old song found liberty where was it church at Calvary is there anybody here who knows about Calvary when you come to Jesus for forgiveness and for mercy and for grace good afternoon y'all may the Lord bless you real good tell a neighbor say neighbor I am a product of the mercy of God it's unlikely mercy I did not believe that kind of mercy that quality that quantity qualitative and quantitative I do not believe that kind of mercy even existed it's not just unlikely it's unlimited mercy it is grace that's greater than all of my sin it's mercy that is greater than all of my transgression it's mercy that's greater than all all of my failure do I have anybody here who understands the unlikely unlimited mercy of God but it's also mercy unlike any other other folk may show it other folk may give it but there's no mercy like the mercy of God he looked beyond my fault hey Lonnie he looked beyond my fault and saw my need would you turn to a neighbor help me close it so I can go ahead and sit down and say I don't know where I'd be if it were not for the mercy of God I'd be on my way to hell I'd be in prison I'd be in the insane asylum I'd be strung out on drugs but his mercy has kept me all of my life hey Marsha I gotta go but did you see what that man said he said Lord when you come in your kingdom remember me I don't know what he really meant remember me by thinking about me don't forget me or could he have meant remember me by putting me back together remember my parts remember my life I'm tore up jacked up from the floor up but if anybody can do it put me back together again Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall Humpty Dumpty had a great fall all the king's horses up all the king's men couldn't put a Humpty together again would you grab one neighbor say my name is Humpty Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and all the king's horses all the king's men couldn't put old Humpty back together again but I know somebody 
He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the great I am. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He's the first and the last. He's the Rose of Sharon. He's the Lily of the Valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the wheel in the middle of a wheel. I know somebody, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christos, Jesus the Lamb of God, and what the king's horses and what the king's men could not do, Jesus put me back together again. I double dog dare you to grab a neighbor, shake him and rock him, rock him and shake him, and say he put me back together again. When you come into your kingdom, remember. go would you look at a neighbor say neighbor my life was jacked up messed up tore up from the floor up but Jesus put the pieces back together again and that's why I praise him and that's why I shout and that's why I give him glory because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and he's done for me my soul cries out hallelujah come on and give him praise When you come into your kingdom, remember me, put me back together, pick up the broken pieces and put my life back together. And what he did for the thief, he'll do it for you. And he'll do it for your son and he'll do it for your daughter and he'll do it for your husband and he'll do it for your wife. And he'll do it for your brother and he'll do it for your daddy. No one is so far that God cannot reach them. What a magnanimous, magnificent move of mercy. He stops dying and turns to a thief and said, what did you say? Today, I assure you, when I go in, you going in with me. Of all the people who could have been in his life, our Lord picks a woman of ill repute. And I don't know if she was just a bad woman or just a woman looking for love in all the wrong places. He picks a gathering demoniac who is dysfunctional, disruptive, and destructive. And you think the brother would have learned his lesson, but on the cross, minutes from dying, he stops dying and says, I'm gonna take you with me. You're gonna ride in on my ticket. And all three of them become a person in his life. And hasn't he done that for all of us today? Come on, hasn't he done that for all of us? And don't we want him to do it for someone else? While the musicians play, and in a moment, Lacey's going to sing, but before he sings, I want to talk to you. I want to ask you, is there anybody you know who's like that gathering demoniac, like that woman, and like that thief who needs Jesus desperately? I want you, I said it at eight, I want you to get their image, their face in your mind 
I, want, I know you're disgusted with him. I know you're disappointed in him. I know you're frustrated. I know you say, I'm sick of it. I've helped them. I said today, you've wasted money on tuition. You've wasted money on bail. You've wasted money on attorneys. And they're getting wusser and wusser, as my grandmother said. And David, I know, I know you get disgusted with him and disappointed and distraught. But would you bring him to Jesus today? I want you to get them in your mind, get them in your mind, get their face and their name in your mind. And I want you to ask God to do for them what he did for the woman at the well, for the gathering demoniac and for the thief on the cross. Because if he'll do it for them, he'll do it for the person you love. Get it in your mind and start praying right now. Lacey's going to sing it softly, the choir, but I want you and some of them are praying too. Matter of fact, all of us are praying.